story of an unusual weekend project and an exciting summer adventure shared by 26 young men from the city of Valdosta, Georgia. This film documents their experiences in forming a unique travel club and in constructing a large camper vehicle to take them on an odyssey into Mexico. The story is divided into two parts. The first deals with the formation of a travel club and the construction of the camper vehicle. Part two relates the experiences of the group on their excursion into Mexico. Beginning in the summer of 1962, several youths from Valdosta, Georgia, began to take trips into the interior of Mexico. Desiring a trip which was out of the ordinary, they avoided the main tourist trails and came into closer contact with the Mexican people. They camped on Mexican farms and in rural areas and saw more of the real Mexico than most casual tourists ever see. This trip was so successful that they returned the next year and each year thereafter. Each time their number increased as more and more people heard about their remarkable experiences. What started out as a simple camping trip involving one car and one tent grew in five years to an entire caravan of vehicles and trailers. How to accommodate more boys with less confusion of vehicles was the problem. The solution came in an idea for a specially constructed vehicle which would serve as a combination bus, home, and restaurant for a large group. A used school bus would be purchased and divided into three compartments, a kitchen area, sleeping compartment, and front riding section. This plan would save much of the money the boys had been spending on accommodation. With these plans in mind, they approached the local Board of Education in hopes of getting a good deal on a used school bus. The board heard the boys' plans for an adventure in Mexico and a constructive project and voted to sell them a bus of their choice from those vehicles scheduled to be retired. The price was one dollar. In November of 1967, they found themselves in the Lowndes County School Bus Yard viewing buses due to be sold at public bidding. They examined the vehicles with a careful eye. Looking under the hoods. Kicking tires. Appraising the interior and exterior condition of each. They had brought with them a list of requirements that their choice must fill. First, it had to meet the mechanical requirements. The engine had to be up to the mark to make a transcontinental journey. Second, it had to have a large interior space to accommodate the boys' plans for three separate compartments. Finally, the exterior of the bus had to be in fairly good shape so as not to need expensive body work. Some buses could be immediately rejected. Others took careful consideration. At last, a bus was selected. It was old number 45, a 72-passenger bus which had seen 10 rugged years of transporting children to and from school. 
the for sale sign was removed. And the boys posed for a snapshot with their new possession. Then they piled aboard for what would be the first of many happy miles to be traveled in the old bus. On the road, the boys enjoyed the ride and dreamed of how they planned to make this old bus see a new light. Finally, the bus arrived at what was to be its home for the next nine months. A local Valdosta businessman, J.C. Woodward, had consented to allow the boys the use of an area in his backyard for their project of converting the vehicle into a camper. Next on the agenda was a meeting of all the boys and their parents plans for the conversion and the Mexican adventure. It was explained how the bus was to become a mobile home for the boys on an 18-day excursion through Mexico. The itinerary of the trip was offered in detail by Louis Holzendorf, a co-leader in the project. Dr. Jose B. Fernandez, professor of Spanish at Valdosta State College, approved the group's plans to study conversational Spanish and acquaint them with the rich history of the country they planned to visit. Finally, souvenirs of past trips were shown to give everyone an idea of Mexican hand craftsmanship. With the parents' enthusiastic approval, work began immediately on the project. First came the quick removal of the 24 bus seats so that the interior painting could begin. The goal was to give the bus a pleasing appearance inside and out, to make it look as little like a school bus as possible. Much of the specialized spray equipment was loaned by interested merchants. Cleaning of the boys' paint-splattered clothes was done by interested mothers. Multicolored paint was chosen for the interior to give it a textured appearance and to cover over the nicks and scrapes of 70,000 miles of former use. While the interior paint dried, 
the exterior of the vehicle came under attack. The boys contributed a great deal of enthusiasm, if not skill, to the project. This young fellow is having a problem with a stubborn sheet metal screw. His approach to master the situation was not an uncommon one. When his patience fails, he turns the problem over to another, who makes it all look so easy. These boys are cutting holes to provide ventilation for the sleeping area of the camper. Screened vents are placed in these openings, which can be closed in wet weather. Younger boys worked alongside older ones in most phases of the project. The small fellows helped by tightening screws, drilling holes, and getting into those tight spots. With the paint dry, it was time to begin work inside. Lumber, most of it donated, was brought in for the framing of walls and dividers. Here the boys began the first of two walls, this one to separate the kitchen area from the sleeping area. boys were able to do the carpentry work by themselves. But when problems invariably turned up, there was always a helpful parent willing to show them how to solve them. The walls had to be wired before covering with paneling. Each wall was paneled with plywood, the most inexpensive and easiest building material to work with. The first wall completed, work began on a second. This one to separate the sleeping compartment from the front compartment. The enthusiasm generated by a day's work often took them into the night. But each would be back again the next day after school, working hard to complete their project. The thought of the trip the boys would take in their camper provided an incentive for some of the boys to improve their grades, as those who failed in school would miss the big trip. The kitchen area received the next attentions of the workers. The cabinets these fellows are building would provide precious storage space for the large amount of food the boys would have to carry on the trip. Food requiring refrigeration would be kept in special gas-operated refrigerators, which were purchased at bargain prices. The larger and more efficient of the two was purchased for $5 at a local salvage yard. A gas range and oven were purchased and installed. This bus had everything, including the kitchen sink. It would be connected to fresh water tanks mounted under the bus. The group cut costs by using discarded glass-lined hot water tanks for water storage. The tanks were purchased for $3 each from a junkyard, stripped of their metal covering and fiberglass insulation. Industrial art students at Lowndes High School carried out the welding phase of the work. The Mexitourists were glad to pay all material costs to have the work done, and the welding students received class credit for the job. Other work under the bus continued, such as installing new brake hoses. Replacing the exhaust system.
running new wires and making good electrical solder joints. To ensure fair distribution of the work, a rating graph was maintained by the leaders. Each boy was individually scored on the basis of the effort he contributed to the project. He would be awarded a certain number of points for each job well done. To this was added or deducted points for conduct. The standing of each boy would be considered when the time came to assign bunks or duties on the trip. It wasn't all work, though, as the mothers of the boys threw a party to celebrate the halfway mark in the work. But the work must continue, as it would soon be summer, and the goal was to finish the bus well in advance of the trip. The job at hand is the construction of furniture for each compartment. Wooden bunk seats in the form of boxes with storage compartments for each boy's clothes were constructed to replace the original bus seat. A table was designed to drop down between these boxes to form a level bed for the night. This was, for some boys, their first experience with carpentry. And except for a stubborn bolt or two, or maybe a stubborn wrench, everything went smoothly. The job at hand here requires either a smaller nail, or a larger hammer, or maybe a larger boy. Boys enjoyed using the spray equipment outfit to make the bunks beautiful. Again, a textured paint was used to cover a few defects in carpentry. Once dry, the boxes were taken into the bus and placed in positions they would occupy so that the boys could fasten them securely to the floor. These scenes should give you some idea of the design of the dinette arrangement. A vertical board forms the back of each seat, while at night, this board becomes a support for a double overhead bunk which folds down from the ceiling. This space-saving arrangement achieves the goal of a completely self-contained travel unit. Work for an electronics-minded member was the installation of the navigator's control panel. The boys would take turns riding next to the driver to monitor the engine gauges, operate the public address system, and two-way radio gear. A cabinet above the driver's position, handy for storage of miscellaneous charts and other items, also contained a small television set to provide entertainment during long hours of travel. To power this TV, as well as fans, lights, and an air conditioner, the boys purchased a gasoline-powered electric generator. Special help from the Valdosta Area Technical School 
was solicited to make a compartment to hold the generator. The boys worked with the welding instructor at the school until they had completed a framework for the generator compartment. The generator was installed and wired into the bus's electrical system. One of the purposes of the venture, as outlined in the meeting with the parents, was to acquaint the boys with the Spanish language. Since they were about to embark on an adventure in Mexico, they were especially receptive to the occasional Spanish lessons, usually held before or after a work session. A word picture book was selected for its direct method of teaching language. The boys studied this book at home, then improved their pronunciation during the lessons by imitating one of the leaders, who majored in Spanish and who spoke it fluently. The boys put a great deal of mental effort into the learning experience. The last phase of construction work was entered into with a flourish of activity. Only two weeks were left before the public dedication ceremony. In this time, the bus would receive its final exterior coat of paint. First, there were some preparations to be made. The old paint had to be removed and some body work completed. With only 37 days remaining, the vehicle was scheduled for painting. This job was done by a professional so as to give the best outward appearance. However, the boys contributed to the project by sanding and masking for the painter. There was scarcely time to admire the bright new finish before the dedication ceremony. First, the sides of the bus had to be lettered. A Valdosta commercial artist, Red Sykes, contributed an afternoon to complete this work in time. The last sign was the boys' thanks to their city and county boards of education for their interest and support in the project. Finally, the trip mascot, a roadrunner named El Paisano, was added on each side of the bus, eagerly racing towards Mexico. And the name of the project. Mexitour 68 was painted on the side of the bus and iced on the dedication day cake. Parents and friends of the boys, as well as interested citizens, came to see the camper bus the boys had constructed and to attend the dedication ceremony. Honorable James Beck, mayor of Valdosta, had this to say about the project. Long hours and arduously and tirelessly for the completion of this bus. They've uh, equipped it. I personally have been through it, and I don't think I've ever seen anything as remarkable in my estimation or my opinion. Then little Dana Franklin attempted to do the honors with a champagne bottle wrapped in festive Mexican colors. Well, with a little help from Mayor Beck. One of the co-leaders in the project, Robert Winter, reminded all that the credit should go to the boys who had persevered for nine months in achieving a distinctive goal, the planning and execution of their modern camper bus. As the boys stood in front of their creation, they recalled the hours of effort that went into its construction. The hours of drilling, and hammering, making tedious adjustments. Every kind of work. Checking and rechecking every detail.
learning Spanish. Their new experience with power tools. Learning to take advice. Working as a team. And to take pride in accomplishment to complete this camper. In which they took so much pride. The meaning of the experience could be summed up in the laughing face of this youngster, a face reflecting the enjoyment of creative work and anticipation of the travel experience in part two of Project Adventure Tour. were strangely quiet for such an important day, a day they had dreamed of for an entire year. But their exhausted sleep was for a good reason, for even before daybreak they were hard at work loading supplies on board the camper. he had underestimated how much space the supplies would occupy in his small kitchen. Although most of the boys had packed days before the trip, there was one who brought his personal gear early that morning. This was transferred into storage spaces under the seat. Each boy had one of these compartments in which to stow all personal equipment and clothes. And somehow, the kitchen crew found space for all that food. Parents and younger brothers and sisters were there to get a last look at El Paisano and to see their boys off to Mexico. For the first time, all the young men were in the same place at the same time, and finally, they were off. It wasn't long before they were wide awake and in good spirit. There wasn't a homesick one in the bunch.
There were some sedate games going on, such as this round of chess with one of the leaders. Each had his way of passing the travel hours through familiar countryside. The television offered entertainment for some. A snack lunch was prepared en route by one of the kitchen crew. And the punch had just the right flavor. Dishwashing was an especially messy chore while traveling. More than once, a rough spot in the road would leave a dishwasher's face and clothes dripping wet. The boys took turns at the navigator position. They monitored gauges and operated the public address system. This scene could be best described as the great train race. It was one of the few things El Paisano could pass at a thundering 55 miles an hour. Nearing Texas, the old bus with its load of adventurers plodded on. They drove through rain, late into the afternoon, and on into the night. Everyone wanted to drive on, and while the drivers took shifts, the boys slept soundly in bunks they had constructed for the occasion. Hundreds of miles later, early in the morning, the bus rolled across the Rio Grande and into Mexican customs. The delay was much less than expected. Because of the crowd, the lone customs official was apparently anxious to see Mexitour 68 on its way. It was clear to the boys, as soon as they crossed the border, that the people here lived in a different world. The countryside was changing also. Mountains began to rise from the desert plains. The first destination was Concepcion del Oro, in the Mexican state of Zacatecas. Reaching the city wasn't easy. One must pass from the lower desert floor of the state of Coahuila to the mountains of Zacatecas. The slope of the road would be a strain on any vehicle, especially a 10-year-old bus loaded with equipment and boys. Concepcion del Oro means conceived or born from gold. And that's the literal truth. The town was established when gold was discovered in the 1800s. Since then, the gold ore petered out, and today the mines remain open for the rich copper deposits in the mountains surrounding the town. These mines are the sole source of revenue for the people living here. Since the town is several miles off the main highway, there's little else to attract tourist trade. For this reason, it was chosen, as it would give the boys a glimpse of the real Mexico, a part of the country unspoiled by tourism. El Paisano parked for the day near the main plaza, and it soon drew a crowd of spectators. Boys struck up friendships with Mexican lads, comparing school and home life. And they found they had much in common. An invitation to play baseball was enthusiastically accepted by the Mexitourists. They formed two teams, the Americanos and the Mexicanos. It was a game played on the Mexicans' home ground. Actually, a flat field of mineral deposits from nearby mines. It was, however, the only flat place for miles around. The Americanos got off to a good start. 
But soon a problem in interpretation of rules developed. There was a small problem in communication, but the Mexitourist's Spanish study paid off, and one was finally able to explain the correct version of the rule. All were amigos again, and the game resumed. In a gesture of friendship, the Mexitourists invited two Mexican boys to accompany them on their journey through Mexico. The Mexican youths, Emilio Gonzalez and Nacho Galvan, shook hands with the Mexitourists and were glad to be included in the rest of the camping adventure. They heard the story of how these young men had built the old bus into a camper to bring them here to Mexico. Spectacular Huasteca Canyon was the next stop. Nestled in the eastern Sierra Madre mountain range, the canyon represents the natural beauty of Mexico. And for the boys, a contact with the rugged sort of outdoor life common to the Mexican people. In this cathedral-like setting, the boys pitched camp and began to prepare a meal. This required teamwork, a trait these young men had in common. Sometimes the meals were not the best, but at least there was enough of it. There was even enough to spare for a lonesome amigo who strayed into camp. Another visitor to the campsite was a young Mexican businessman on a burro. He offered his burro for a ride, for a price that is. He proposed to let the boys ride his burrow through the valley and up into the mountain's foothills. The price was two pesos. But after much good-natured bargaining, the price was agreed upon at one peso, or eight cents a ride through the canyon. For these Mexican tourists, it was the first time ever on a burrow. And it was soon clear that this animal wasn't going to be hurried. A stream ran through the canyon, and the boys applied their American ingenuity to dam it up and make a swimming hole. The clear, fresh water was ideal for swimming and bathing. And even shaving, if one was willing to shave under such crude conditions. But the boys had to stay on the lookout for falling rocks and maybe falling goats from the herds up on those cliffs. Before leaving Huasteca Canyon, it seemed appropriate to leave a monument to the visit there, with a promise to return in 69. A few days later, and a few hundred miles south, El Paisano entered the city of Guanajuato a Spanish colonial-style city, centuries old, Guanajuato was the cradle of the Mexican Revolution. The streets are very narrow, having been laid out long before the age of mechanized travel. All are understandably one way today, and even so, the bus barely squeezed through. An old Mexican saying has it that the streets are so narrow that dogs learn to wag their tails up and down. The city, founded more than 400 years ago by the Spaniards, is laid out along the bottom of a ravine surrounded by mountains. It's a region in which some of the fiercest fighting of the Mexican Revolution took place more than 100 years ago. In many ways, the town is the same as it was then. It's a colonial landmark prohibited by law from undergoing any change in its original architectural style. It has so many plazas, it has been dubbed seven plazas in search of a city. It is also often called the city of staircase sidewalks because of the steep, hilly setting. 
Because of the narrow sidewalks, the Mexi tourists had to proceed single file. Antique shops were numerous, and there were many items the boys would have liked to bring home if only they had had enough money and space would allow. There was much to photograph in the way of monuments and beautiful buildings constructed by the Spaniards. The steps of the Juarez Theater formed a rendezvous for the young men when it was time to eat. While waiting for stragglers to show up for lunch, a passing organ grinder cranked out a serenade. When asked where his monkey was, you guessed it, inside, taking a siesta. After the serenade, the Mexican tourists proceeded to a restaurant for lunch. The restaurant, true to the Spanish colonial style of architecture, was built around a patio which opened to the sky. It was a veritable hanging garden. They were given a choice of two menus chicken or beefsteak. This fellow on the right has just discovered a strange looking entree. He's not so sure if it's edible or not. Some later found out that highly spiced Mexican food can leave you with a good case of the blah. In another part of Mexico, more than 9,000 feet above sea level, lies Real de Catorce, once a thriving city of 35,000 in its heyday of gold and silver mining, now a ghost town. The road to the town is only suitable for especially rugged, short wheel base vehicles. The town is so isolated that there's only one way to enter or leave, through a half mile tunnel for one way traffic carved in the side of a mountain. Since El Paisano could never make such a trip, the boys parked and transferred to a minibus, which makes special runs to the town. Although only 28 kilometers, or roughly 17 miles, the trip to the town takes over two hours. Why does it take so long to travel such a short distance? First, the paved road changes rapidly into a dirt road, which soon disintegrates into a trail, which gets rougher and rougher. It was impossible to take pictures and some suffered an occasional bump on the head, like against the roof of the bus. It was too much for one Mexican tourist. The last half mile of the torturous trip was through the tunnel. It was once used to haul out the gold ore mined there. The narrow streets of the ghost town are cobblestone and was the only place where we found deserted streets. The materials for building the town more than a century ago had to be hoisted up the mountain on muleback through treacherous roads and passages. 
At one time, gold coins called reales were minted here for Spain. Real de Catorce means the gold of the 14, and was drawn from the 14 bandits who years ago waylaid shipments of the precious ore on its way to the railway. The boys were glad to get on solid ground and off that bouncy bus for a while. Here, they were free to roam at will and to explore the old town. Much of the town was in ruins, but even so, it gave the boys a good idea of how life must have been back when the town was a Mexican Mecca. After some exploration of ruins, the visitors discovered that not all the population had passed away. Mexican muchachas, or little girls, are somewhat shy in nature, no doubt due to their Spanish heritage. A stranger is to be avoided at all costs. And one with a camera, well, it's best to run for cover, like behind Mama's imposing figure. On the other hand, muchachos are like boys everywhere. The rocky terrain here is in no way a deterrent to a game of marbles. Here, there's no such thing as a straight shot. After a morning's exploration, the Mexitourist joined up with some Mexican youth who wanted to show them the beautiful view of the mountains at the edge of the city. On the way up, they passed through a green forest of cactus. The prickly plants thrive here in the high altitude and produce a red fruit known as tuna, which the people cultivate to eat and to make jam and candy. Emilio cut into one of the tunas to give the boys their first taste of this desert treat. This Mexitourist isn't quite sure if he likes this new delicacy or not. Hmm, sort of like raspberry jam, or maybe cranberries. The back door of this unusual town is a drop-off into the deep canyon below. In the distance, more ruins A part of the town can be seen, and a small stream, complete with waterfall, flows at the bottom of the ravine. The boys were exhausted at the end of their day's activities and ready to return to camp when the bus arrived. The last night in Mexico featured a Mexican mariachi band. Thank you. 
According to Mexican tradition, every birthday party should have a piñata, a clay gourd filled with candy and favors which the birthday honoree shares when he breaks the gourd with a stick while blindfolded. This piñata was an easy one because David was led right to it in order to preserve the windows in the bus. Even the mariachis were caught up in this final festive moment. And guess who got the most candy? You guessed it, the small fella on the bottom. The Mexican tourists last sunrise in Mexico found them in somewhat different sleeping positions. Before rising, they lay on their cots reflecting on their experiences of the past two weeks. Unique and heartwarming experiences. Amistad, or friendship with Mexican youth. The rugged outdoor life a sense of duty and responsibility. All the experiences and adventures which would lead the boys onward and upward. To the achievement of that most important goal in life, maturity. And in maturity, they would remember and appreciate the role they had played in that unique experience called Project Adventure Tour.